Greetings everyone! Before we begin with today's Octopath Traveler lore episode, I have a quick announcement. Alongside this video today, I have also released a second video, detailing the plans that I have for this lore series and the complications that have arisen over the past couple months that may serve to hinder or halt the plan completely. If you're interested in the status and the future of this lore series as well as the state of this channel, I ask that you go watch this secondary video. You may be able to find it in the related videos, you can find it on my channel under the Octopath Traveler lore playlist, or I have included a link in the description below to take you straight to it. Your choice. Now with that out of the way, today's Octopath Traveler lore episode will begin in 3, 2, 1. Greetings fellow Octopathians. Octopath Traveler lore class is back in session. First off, I want to apologize for how long it's taken to get this episode up. Let's just say my personal life has been a complete whirlwind of chaos for the last few weeks, and my ISP has decided to start having some outage issues as well. But everything's normalizing now for the moment, so uploads can resume. And on that note, today's lore episode will be on Haunted the Huntress. Unlike most of the other protagonists, Haunted doesn't have an origin story really to talk about. What the writers of the game opted for instead for Haunted was developing a story about what it truly means to be a hunter or huntress of the Darkwood, and also setting up key plot points for Alfin and Tressa's storylines as well as the endgame. So today's discussion will take on more the form of my previous video on Cyrus. There will be no prologue section because there's not really much backstory to speak of. We're just going to jump straight into Haunted's story. And so, without further ado, I present to you the story of Haunted the Huntress. Enjoy. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't take at least a moment to explain the tribe that Haunted hails from, the Hunters of the Darkwood, in the village of Swarky, deep within the woodlands. This tribe is one of two that has been blessed by the goddess Dreyfendi with the powers of beast lore. Beast lore allows hunters to tame even the most ferocious monsters of the wild and summon them into battle as an ally. There was a time centuries ago that many hunters within both the Darkwood and the Greenwood were able to utilize beast lore. However, as time progressed, fewer and fewer hunters from both tribes were blessed with this ability. And by the time Octopath Traveler begins, only three hunters still retain the ability to use beast lore. Hanit, her master Zanta, and the father of Ashlyn the Beast Tamer of the Greenwood tribe. With the ability to utilize beast lore being so rare, hunters bearing this ability have become a precious commodity and their services are highly desired to slay fearsome beasts that may be troubling the nearby lands. And it is in this regard that Haunted's master, Zanta, has guarded a reputation of being the greatest hunter in all of Orstera. There has never been a beast during Zanta's career that he could not capture or kill. However, one year before Octopath Traveler begins, Zanta accepts a contract to hunt a beast that will prove ultimately to be his match. As Zanta prepares to leave Swarky on his newest hunt, he takes a moment to stop and speak with Haunted about his newest contract. Zanta has been commissioned by the Knights Ardant of the Order of the Sacred Flame to hunt down a hellish fiend known as the Red Eye. Confident in her master's abilities as he's not failed a single hunt, Hanit takes the time to remind Zanta not to partake in his vices while on his journey. As during his last hunt, Zanta took the time to visit Victor's Hollow and gamble away his entire coin purse on the fights at the arena. And Eliza of the Knights Ardant had to pay his debts to keep him out of debtor's prison. Eliza promises to Hanit that she will do her best to keep Zanta out of trouble and keep him focused on the hunt. Zanta then realizes it's time to leave the village of Swarky on the hunt with his companion direwolf, Hagen. He promises to Hanit that the hunt should take no longer than two cycles of the moon, and then departs on the hunt. Many months later, Hanit receives a letter from Zanta detailing the progress of the hunt. At the time of the letter's writing, it is three months after he left Swarky, and he admits that the Red Eye is the most vexing quarry that he's ever had to hunt. Zanta claims that Red Eye appears to have human-like intelligence, and has eluded every single one of his traps. However, Zanta believes that he has annoyed Red Eye enough to force it to flee to another region of Orstera, to Stoneguard specifically. He does not believe that the hunt will end anytime soon, so he implores upon Haunted to keep looking over Swarky in his absence. Fast forward to present day, and after one year of Zanta being away on the hunt, Haunted and her companion Snow Leopard Lind 
are becoming concerned for the safety of Zanta in his direwolf Hagen. However, Hanit continues to have faith in her master's abilities and asserts that he should return from the hunt any time now. However, in the meantime, Hanit decides to check with the headman of Swarky to see if there are any contracts available. It is then during this section that the player is exposed to the traditions of the Darkwood and the dialect of the people that live within it. Since Swarky is isolated from the rest of Orstera by a thick forest, the hunters of Swarky use Old English dialect in their speak, and they also carry on the traditions of old, living by the ways of nature and of the forest. After all, here in the wild, the hunter can easily become the hunted. Returning to our story, Haunted speaks with the headman and finds that there are no hunts that require doing. Though the headman would be most appreciative if Haunted would put a few of the youngsters through their lessons. Hanit agrees to the task, and proceeds to provoke two of the youngsters of the village into a battle with Lind. Lind defeats both fledgling hunters, but Hanit makes sure that they learn their lessons for the day by figuring out what went wrong during their battle. However, just as the lesson ends, a young girl comes to fetch Hanit as the headman requests her presence immediately. Hanit reports to the headman, and he tells her that Lord Siren of the nearby province has contracted the services of the best hunter of Swarky, which in this case would be Hanit due to Zanta's absence. Lord Siren's messenger explains to Hanit that a beast known as the Gisarma is now residing within the Whisperwood outside of its natural habitat, and it is attacking anybody and any beast that comes within its path. Lord Siren wishes for Hanit to slay the beast and to restore peace to his province. Seeing as the Gisarma does not belong in the Whisperwood, Hanit accepts the contract and heads to the Whisperwood without delay. While on the trail of the Gisarma, Hanit arrives at a grisly site. The Gisarma has slaughtered an entire congregation of wolf and man alike and left their corpses to rot on the side of the road. Hanit examines the wounds on the corpses and discovers that the Gisarma did not kill them for survival, but rather for sport. Seeing as how killing for sport goes against the laws of nature and the rules of the forest, Hanit is further resolved to seek out the Gisarma and kill it. In the back of the Whisperwood, Hanit finally finds her quarry, which is about to slaughter two more wolves for sport. As Hanit approaches, the two wolves flee, and Hanit states that she does not fear the Gisarma, and that she will punish the beast for the sins it has committed upon the forest. And Hanit does battle with the Gisarma, which proves to be a dreadful beast, as it manages to counter most of Hanit's maneuvers. However, Hanit proves to be the superior hunter, and she slays the beast. Hanit then calls upon the creatures of the Whisperwood to come and claim the Gisarma's corpse, that it may provide sustenance for the meat eaters, and its bones become the wood and sap that the plant eaters would eat, thus carrying on the cycle of life within the forest. On her way back to Swarky, Hanit runs into Lord Siren's messenger again and informs him that the Gisarma has been slain, and she also notices that the messenger has dug graves for the human victims of the Gisarma. The messenger compliments Hanit on a job well done, and tells her that he felt it was only right to bury the humans that were killed by the creature. Hanit then instructs the messenger to leave the wolf corpses be and to let the forest reclaim them, to which he agrees. When Hanit returns to the village, she is shocked to find Zanta's direwolf Hagen waiting for her, whimpering. Hanit immediately fears the worst for her master, and decides to immediately set out on a journey to go to his aid. Hanit decides to begin her hunt in Stoneguard which was the last location mentioned by Zanta in his letter, and hopefully she will be able to pick up his trail from there. She informs the headman of the village that she should only be gone for one moon, and hopefully will return with her master by her side. After departing Swarky, Hanit begins traveling southeast toward the highlands to Stoneguard, and along the way, she meets with the other seven protagonists, who pledge their skill and determination to her cause. And after a fairly expeditious journey, Hanit and her party arrive in the highlands to Stoneguard. A formidable beast, but this was not the red eye that Master sought. When Hanit and her party arrive in Stoneguard, she decides that the best place to start her investigation into Zanta's whereabouts is to go to the local alehouse. At the tavern, Hanit orders a bowl of broth and asks the tavern keeper if he knows of Zanta. The tavern keeper replies that he does know Zanta, and the only lead that he can provide Hanit is that Zanta had been frequently visiting a woman named Natalia who lives in the city. Hanit thanks the tavern keeper for the information and finishes her bowl of broth, only to step outside where Hagen picks up a familiar scent and runs off. 
Cyrus hypothesizes that Stoneguard being an epicenter of activity for the Highlands may have been throwing Hagen's sense of smell off. But now Hagen may have picked up on the trail of Zanta after taking some time to filter through the different scents in the area, and he suggests that they pursue him. Hanit finds Hagen outside the book bindery, growling at a soldier while behind him, a lecherous rich man named Nathan is hitting on Natalia. Hagen apparently recognizes Natalia and is trying to get past the soldier to protect her from Nathan. Hanit immediately recognizes Hagen's intent and has Lind provoke Nathan's bodyguard into battle in an attempt to both run him and Nathan off. After a successful skirmish, Nathan and his bodyguard run away to the north end of town and Hanit gets to formally meet with Natalia. Hanit begins to inquire of Natalia what she knows of Zanta. Natalia tells Hanit that her deceased husband and Zanta were good friends and hunting partners, and that Zanta had been frequently visiting her to console her over her loss. However, his last visit to her was three months ago, just before he was about to enter the Spectre Wood, giving chase to the Red Eye. Hanit does take a moment to confide in Natalia about her life story and that she had no kin, and Zanta was the only father figure she had growing up though she implores Natalia never to admit that to him as he would never let her live it down. Natalia agrees to keep the conversation between them, and then Hanit begins to set out for the Spectre Wood. Along the trail, Hanit notices that the road has been partially destroyed by a recent rock slide, and she's forced to find another way around. After a brief search of the area, Lind identifies the path that the forest animals have been used to get into the Spectre Wood after the rock slide. However, Lind also identifies a dangerous monster in the guise of a tree, blocking the path, killing unsuspecting prey that pass through. Hanit provokes the monster into battle and finds out that it's X-Death, I mean the Ancient One. Uprooting the deadly tree monster, the path to the Spectre Wood is revealed, and Hanit steps inside. In the back of the wood, Hanit finds an area where a recent battle has taken place, with sword nicks in the rock, boot trails in the ground, and arrow shafts stuck in the dirt. Hanit inspects one of the arrow shafts, and discovers that the arrow belongs to her master. She surmises that the trail must continue further back into the woods, however Hanit and the party are stopped by the Lord of the Forest. While the Lord of the Forest is the protector of all the creatures that live within the Spectre Wood, Hanit and the party are forced to put it down in order to continue following the trail. At the end of the trail, Hanit finally finds her master, only he has been petrified. Hanit takes a moment to examine the surroundings and finds one of Zanta's arrows drove into a rock nearby with a note attached to it. The note is from Zanta and he explains exactly what happened to him. Zanta had finally caught up with the Red Eye and confronted it, but what he did not expect was for the Red Eye to cast a petrification curse on him. The curse began with his feet and progressed up the remainder of his body, and in the time before the curse fully took him, he penned this note. He then implores that whoever is reading the note to visit the village of Still Snow and find the seer, Susanna as she may be the only person who knows how to reverse the petrification. And in a postscript, he writes that if Hanit is the one who is reading the note, that he is sorry that he could not keep his promise and return to Swarky safely. Hanit then takes a short time to lament that her master has finally found the quarry that ended up bringing him down, but also realizes that she must head to Still Snow and find Susanna. In order to protect Zanta's body in the meantime, Hagen elects to remain by Zanta's side to protect his body from the creatures of the forest and any other invaders. Afterwards, Hanit returns to Natalia in Stoneguard, as she feels that she should be the first person to know what happened. Hanit has barely any time to explain to Natalia that Zanta has been petrified when Eliza of the Knights Ardant walks into the residence. Hanit explains to Eliza what happened, and she demands to know what the Knights Ardant know of the Red Eye, as she suspects the church is hiding something. Eliza admits that she knows nothing of the Red Eye, but apparently the higher ups of the Knights Ardant knew of the danger, and that is why they contracted the services of Zanta, as he was the best hunter of the realm. By their estimation, sending a regiment with Zanta would have only hindered his ability, and if Zanta couldn't kill the creature, then nobody could. Hanit affirms that the judgment of the Knights Ardant was correct, and she tells Eliza that she must now partake on a mission to Still Snow to meet with the Seer Susana while Eliza agrees to continue the hunt for the Red Eye in the meantime. Both women agree to begin their tasks immediately, and begin to exit Stoneguard. Natalia stops Hanit on the way out of town to give her a gift of various supplies for her journey to Still Snow. Natalia admits that this is merely a trifle, but it's the best she can do to help Hanit on her journey. Hanit thanks Natalia for the gift, and promises to do nothing reckless and get herself killed while trying to save her master. 
And then Han and the party leave Stoneguard, traveling northward to Still Snow. Oh, well, well. That young master of yours has managed to get himself into a right mess, hasn't he? After a rather expeditious journey to the north, Han and her party arrive in Still Snow. Near the town entrance, Lin takes a moment as a snow leopard to frolic in the snow as this is her natural habitat. Hanad is amused by Lin's behavior, she's not used to seeing her act like a small kitten. Not long after, two small children take notice of Hanad and Lin, and they ask if they can pet Lin. Hanad assures the children that Lin is not vicious and she is a gentle creature. As the two children pet and caress Lin, Hanad asks the children if they know of the seer Susanna. The children reply that if she's talking about the witch Susanna, she need only look in the north end of Still Snow for the house with the red roof. Hanit thanks the children for the information, and when they're done playing with Lind, Hanit and Lind proceed to the north end of town. Outside of Susanna's home, Hanit bears witness to Susanna's bodyguard, Oleg, rejecting a wayfaring man that has traveled many leagues over Orstera to have his fortune told. Two of the residents inform Hanit that Susanna is not a fan of her own popularity, and Oleg's purpose here is to prevent all visitors from entering her abode and bothering her. As Hanit reviews her options on how to get past Oleg, Therion proposes that she set Lin against him, as he has past experience with big burly men being easily scared by beasts from the wild. Hanit accepts Therion's counsel and orders Lin to attack Oleg, and with some help from her beast lore ability, Hanit is able to defeat Oleg and get the attention of Susanna who walks out just after the battle is ended. Susanna asks Hanit to bring Oleg inside before he catches a cold, and she explains the true nature of her abilities as a seer. It turns out Susanna has no magical powers at all, and she has no all-seeing eye. All fortunes that she makes are based on pure deductive reasoning. Susanna then asks Hanit if she's disappointed to find out that she's a fraud, which Hanit replies, it's quite the contrary. By telling the truth, Hanit knows that Susanna can be trusted. Pleased to hear this, Susanna invites Hanit into her home, and inquires what the purpose of her visit is. Hanit explains that Zanta has been afflicted with a petrification curse from the Red Eye, and that she is seeking help from Susanna in order to dispel it. Susanna explains that the only way to break the petrification curse is to kill the creature that cast it in the first place. She then also informs Hanit that many years ago a creature plagued the Frostlands that had the same ability as the Red Eye to petrify, and the residents of Still Snow found that the Herb of Grace hidden away in the Whitewood has the ability to ward off petrification so long as the curse has not fully taken effect. Susanna then instructs Hanit to head north to the Whitewood where Oleg will show her the trail that leads to the heart of the woods. Arriving at the entrance of the Whitewood, Oleg is in position as promised and shows Hanit the trail that she needs to take. Following the trail into the heart of the Whitewood, Hanit finds the Herb of Grace and an unexpected surprise. The Grove of the Herb of Grace is also the lair of a mighty dragon. But not just any dragon, the last living dragon of Orstera. As Hanit stares down her opponent, she has a flashback of when Zanta told her as a child of the time he went dragon hunting in the Clifflands, where he killed the second of the three dragons of Orstera. Hanit used to believe that Zanta's stories of slaying a dragon were all poppycock, but after seeing the last living dragon before her eyes, she knows that he was telling the truth and that she will have her own fantastical tale to tell when this is all over. Hanit and her party then go to battle with the mighty dragon, whose scales appear nigh impenetrable, its claws razor sharp, its fire breath, the heat akin to the magma of a volcano, and its wings, with every flap, capable of creating hurricane force winds. After a long battle of attrition and wearing down the dragon's scaly hide, Hanit finally slays the dragon, and claims the herb of grace that she came for. As Hanit and Lind attempt to leave the Whitewood, Direwolves approach the dragon's lair and find that the Lord of the Woods has been slain, and the natural order of the Whitewood has been disrupted. Hanit decides to let the creatures of the Whitewood determine what their future is, and exits the Whitewood. Back at the entrance, Hanit is surprised to find Alaic waiting for her. She's perplexed that Alaic would tarry despite Susanna's instructions only to show Hanit where the trail was. Alaic asserts that he can tarry where he pleases as he is a free man, but as he's walking away, Hanit notices that he's blushing. Returning to Susanna's home, the seer begins to prepare potions using the Herb of Grace as Hanit recalls her battle with the mighty dragon. 
Susana implores Hana to be careful when retelling this tale to Zanta as he might become jealous as her stories are far more eloquent than his could ever be. Knowing that her master is not one for being shown up, she agrees with Susana's judgment and leaves the home with 10 Herb of Grace potions in her possession. As Hana begins to leave Still Snow, she is intercepted by a messenger from the Knights or Dawn. Eliza demands Hanit's presence immediately in the desert capital of Marceline, as the Red Eye has been spotted just west of the city. Hanit tells the messenger to return to Eliza and inform her that she will be making her way to Marceline with all due haste. As the messenger leaves Still Snow, Hanit is stopped one final time by Susanna and Alaic. Hanit apologizes to Susanna for any inconvenience that she may have caused her, but Susanna rebuffs the apology saying it's unnecessary as she sees Hanit as a sort of granddaughter and there is no burden when it comes to family. Susanna then wishes for Hanit's safety, and Hanit promises to return to Still Snow with Zanta in tow. Hanit then leaves Still Snow, making her way southward to the Sunlands, to the desert capital of Marceline, with Alaic leaving some unrequited words left unsaid. Thou hast taken people from us, and we shall have them back. After an expeditious trip southward that is presumed to only last but a few days, Hanit and her party arrive at Marsali, the jewel of the desert. Immediately upon entering the city, Hanit and Lin have a hard time adapting to the harsh desert climate and resolve to find some shade so they may cool down. While searching for shade, Cyrus takes a moment to inform Hanit and the party about the history of Marsaline and of the Sunlands. He explains that for many centuries, the tribes of the Sunlands fought over the most precious resource of the region, water. However, it was only a short time ago that the region was unified under one leadership through the efforts of King Kaleem. He convinced the warlords to talk to each other instead of fighting with each other for resources and established an empire in Marsali for the people, by the people. And in commemoration of the unification of the Sunlands, the people built a brand new palace just for King Kaleem, dubbed the Jade Palace. And it is from there that King Kaleem rules his subjects kindly, justly, and fairly. After this brief history lesson, Hanit comes upon a sergeant of the Knights Ardan who has been expecting her. The sergeant explains that Lady Eliza has been waiting for Hanit's arrival, and that she is in the residence right behind him, which is serving as the current forward operating base for the Knights Ardan. The sergeant takes Hanit inside to meet with Eliza, and Eliza explains that they have managed to track down the Red Eye to the Grimsand ruins just west of the city. However, the Red Eye's arrival at the ruins has caused a completely new problem. All of the monsters that resided within the ruins have fled in fear of the beast, and they are now roaming the surface of the desert and could attack Marsalim at any time. King Kaleem has ordered that General Lenar take a detachment of the city guard out into the desert and to fully rout the enemy. However, there has been no word from the detachment since the morning, and the Knights are not fear that the regiment may have entered the ruins and attempted to face the Red Eye. Hanit then wishes to say a prayer for the safety of the men and turns to Ophelia for guidance. Ophelia then asks Hanit to repeat after her as they say a prayer to Elfric for the safety of the regiment. However, this prayer comes all too late, as the regiment is nearly annihilated by the Red Eye's curse. Per the orders of General Lenar, Captain Raff flees the scene and returns to Marceline to inform King Kaleem of what has befallen them. After Raff gives his report, Kaleem is pleased to hear that the men fought bravely until the end, but insists that their deaths must be avenged. However, at that moment, Hanit steps forward and interrupts King Kaleem, telling him that they can do better than revenge, and that by slaying the beast, the men can be returned to both their king and their families. Hanit then volunteers to hunt down the Red Eye, alone. Kaleem then takes a moment to approach Hanit and look into her eyes, and he notices the same glitter of steel in her eyes that previous heroes of the Sunlands once had, and thus entrusts the fate of his entire kingdom to Hanit. Captain Raff and Eliza then inform the king that they will take their forces and try to push back the monsters outside the Grimsand ruins, giving Hanit an opening to enter. Kaleem blesses the plan and sends them away to prepare for battle. After a brief window to stock up on weapons, armor, and resources, Hanit, the Knights are daunt, and what remains of the Marsalim city guard launch a blitzkrieg operation against the horde of fiends that have overrun the Grimsand desert. An opening to the ruins is quickly exposed, and Hanit takes the opportunity to dash inside while the battle rages on outside. In the back of the ruins, Hanit finds General Lenar and his petrified soldiers, as well as the Red Eye. But, 
Hanit makes a most unusual observation about her quarry. Hmm. I do not understand. This creature's heart, I cannot read it. I can sense the feelings of every beast, every monster. But from this one, nothing. Still, my task remaineth the same. Thou hast taken people from us, and we shall have them back. Charging into battle with the Red Eye, Hanit and her party come face to face with the Fiend's hellish powers, as its very roar can knock a man unconscious. Its body can writhe and contort to change its weaknesses at a whim, and its infamous gaze can petrify you on the spot. After a lengthy battle with the resilient beast, Hanit finally lays the Red Eye low. The monster instantly disintegrates upon death, and all of its victims who had been petrified are free from its curse. Returning to Marceline with General Lenar and his men, Hanit finds a victory party waiting for her. King Kaleem thanks Hanit for saving his realm and the lives of his men, and at first proposes a banquet in her honor, but knows that she cannot tarry for long, as she must return to Stoneguard to see if her master has been freed from the curse. Recognizing that he would be remiss if he didn't thank Hanit in some way, Kaleem orders General Lenar and his men to escort Hanit out of the Sunlands back to Stoneguard to verify if Zanta has been freed. While on the road just outside Stoneguard, Hanit comes across two travelers that are being attacked by an Azurai tiger. She yells at the travelers to get out of the way before the beast hurts them, but the Azurai tiger is suddenly struck down by an arrow in the back. Hanit is at first perplexed by this sudden development until Hagen approaches her, followed by the newly revived Zanta. Zanta asks Hanit if she has grown in some way while he was gone and she replies, maybe not in height, but in experience, to which he agrees that must be it. She then informs Zanta that he has apologies to make across the board, not only to her, but to Natalia, Susanna, and Eliza for all the trouble he has caused them. Zanta agrees to apologize to all the women at some point, but insists on hearing about Hanit's adventures while he was petrified. And so, on the road back to Swarky, Hanit shares her entire tale with him, including the fantastical tale of how she slew the last living dragon of Orstera. We then get a brief excerpt from a much older Hanit that tells us that she has recalled this tale many times over many years. However, she does warn that much like Zanta would do, each time she tells the tale, it ends up being slightly different than the last time. So, in a way, the storytelling techniques of her master did rub off on her in some way, despite her annoyance. And as Hanit and Zanta arrive back home in Swarky, you would be surprised to find that this is not the end of Hanit's tale. Sometime later, Hanit reunites with the other protagonists, and they perform an expedition back into the Grimsand Ruins. Returning to the room where the Red Eye was slain, the party discovers a piece of parchment that was not here before. The writing on the parchment reads as follows. All too rarely, there are moments when the madness passes, and reason and lucidity return. It is then that I feverishly write these words. I beg of you, pray, kill me. For in that sweet sleep, I must believe I will find atonement at last. Forgive me, Kit. This parchment reveals that the Red Eye was no beast, but a man the entire time. And the man in question is the father of a boy named Kit. And Kit should be a familiar face, as depending on which protagonist the player chooses first to start the game with, Kit will be outside their starting town, and asks for a healing grape to mend his wounds after being attacked by monsters on the road. While Kit doesn't tell you much in your first encounter with him, he's actually on a journey to find his missing father. Seeing as how we know the fate of Kit's father, the question then becomes, who or what did this to him? However, the answer to this is not so easy to explain, and is a story best left for another time. And with that, that brings today's lore video on Haunted the Huntress to an end. If you've been watching my lore videos up to this point, first off, thank you. And secondly, you probably noticed that the pieces of the puzzle regarding the endgame are starting to come together. But for now, two protagonists remain, Alfin and Tressa. And for the purposes of having a more coherent story and timeline as far as these protagonist lore videos go, I will be doing Tressa the Merchant next time. 
When I compared Alfin's story and Tress's story and how they flow after Haunted's story, I found that Tress's story flows better afterwards and that Alfin's better safe for last. So, I do hope that you will join me next time for the lore of Tressa Colzione, the Merchant. So with that, I will leave things here for the day. And, as always, if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please do so. If you liked the video, be sure to share it with your friends and give it a thumbs up. And if you disliked it, show it to your enemies. And if you're feeling vocal, use the comments section down below. As I've said in previous videos, this is a scholarly endeavor, not an echo chamber. So I really want to hear what you have to say, and I'm sure your peers would like to hear from you as well. And with that, I will leave today's lore episode here. Thank you so much for watching, and I will catch you next time.